In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Daniel. We're continuing our series on Daniel. And the king has just finished this beautiful praise of God, King Nebuchadnezzar, who goodness knows has his problems and doesn't always get it right. He has just finished this amazing praise of God, this sort of prayer that he offers up talking about God's greatness and how amazing it is that he has blessed him with Daniel and with his other servants and that God has been good to him. And so there is both a level of humility and gratitude, and that's the passage that we just covered before going to this one. And yet, I do think it's a little odd that when he has another dream, and he's already, remember at this point in the book, he's already had his dreams interpreted by Daniel correctly once already. But yet when he has another dream, he goes to the other magicians to interpret his dream before Daniel. And I don't know if he just wanted to see if they could get this one right or what, but it does seem a little odd that the guy who really got the job and, and got where he is and got famous by being able to interpret the king's dream, he kind of goes to them first. And when they fail him, then he goes to Daniel. So I don't know why he chose to go there first. I think maybe that could be a sign of something that we as humans occasionally do as well. That even though we know that the right answer is to go to God immediately, to go to him with our concerns first, that sometimes despite knowing that and despite experience actually teaching us that, sometimes we still opt to try to use our own wisdom or the wisdom of others before we take it to God in prayer. And that in and of itself, I think, is a good lesson for us to learn. But we do want to go ahead and look at this passage in Daniel chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, where it says, But finally Daniel came in before me. Keep in mind, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. But finally Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom a spirit of the, is the spirit of the holy gods. And I related a dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream, which I have seen along with its interpretation. Now, I want to point out here that in Nebuchadnezzar's wisdom, he does know that Daniel has the power to interpret his dream. He does know from experience that this is a talent, an ability that, that Daniel has, and he understands that it is a supernatural ability. So there's a lot to get right here that you can praise Nebuchadnezzar on, but there's also stuff in here that he doesn't necessarily get right. And we want to kind of break those two down. First of all, since he does acknowledge that Daniel is the person to go to, he acknowledges that because God has blessed him with this supernatural power to interpret dreams, he correctly looks at the situation and says, Daniel's the one I need to go to. Even though he went to the other magicians first, he still realizes Daniel is the one that has the ability to do this, and he has a lot of confidence in Daniel's ability. So there he is right. But one thing that I do want you to, to notice here that he seems to put an awful lot of the emphasis on Daniel and not God. And this is another mistake that even modern Christians can make from time to time. And I tell people this all the time when they're impressed by or compliment me on saying things that are, are wise or profound. Sometimes I do come up with my own stuff. But nine times out of ten, my response to that is, look, I didn't come up with this. I'm just borrowing it from God's word. I'm not the guy who invented water. I just happen to know where there's a well. That's all I am. I'm just a messenger. And by the way, if you look back at the first chapter of Daniel, that's exactly the stance that Daniel takes too. Daniel acknowledges that his abilities and his powers, they're not his. They come from God. And he's told Nebuchadnezzar this on multiple occasions. And yet, 
it seems as though Nebuchadnezzar still seems stuck on referring to Daniel as the one that has the power, that has the ability. He does say that there's a, a spirit of the holy gods inside of him, but he still seems to be dangerously close to putting the emphasis on Daniel and not God. And this is a trap that we can fall into. We all have friends that we admire or we think that are wise or that happen to have a pretty good handle on the Bible and, and some of the precepts taught within it. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But we also have to recognize that they're just messengers and humans too. Even when John was confronted with an angel in the book of Revelation and he fell down and started worshiping, the angel was like, no, 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 you, you misunderstand. I, I'm not God. I'm just an angel. Don't worship me. I'm a messenger just like you are. There is only one that is actually worthy of worship. There is only one that is actually worthy of that level of praise and admiration. And it's not John, and it's not the angels, and it's not Daniel. And it's not our, our preachers, and it's not our parents. It's God. So while there might be a lot of wisdom that comes from some of these individuals, youth ministers, college ministers, uh, preachers that we happen to know, or, or just random people that happen to be very knowledgeable about the Bible, even though it's it, they, those can be a great blessing in our life. And Nebuchadnezzar is right to realize that Daniel is a blessing in his life. We need to also acknowledge that any wisdom that they have or any intelligence that they have or compassion or whatever else it is, we have to remember that God gave that to them. That he's really the one, that he's the source of it, and because of that, he's the only one that we ought to actually worship. And the thing about Nebuchadnezzar that is unfortunate here is he kind of tries to have his boot in both camps. He sort of wants to have one foot on the God is almighty and God is the most powerful side, and he also kind of wants at least one foot in the other camp, which is there's still all these other gods and idols that I continue to worship. And this is something that Israel struggled with quite a bit. So Nebuchadnezzar is not alone in this. Unfortunately, the history of Israel, for the most part, is Israel struggling with the sin of adultery. And when I say adultery, I mean spiritual adultery. Idolatry. You see, they were worshiping idols, and they were worshiping other gods, and it's not that they didn't believe in their God. Obviously, they believed in their God, and they believed that their God was powerful and important because they had seen some of the wonders and heard his prophets, but they believed that that was just one God of a lot of gods, and maybe even God's the most powerful, but that doesn't mean the other gods aren't still out there, and they don't still have power, and we shouldn't worship them as well. Unfortunately, this was a trap that Israel found itself in over and over and over again. Despite the fact that the old law is very clear, there is one God and you do not worship idols. Despite this, Israel fell into this so many times, sometimes even from the top, with kings and queens and officials engaging in worship and trying to force other people to engage in this worship as well. And so unfortunately, this was a common problem, not only with Nebuchadnezzar, but with God's own chosen people in this period as well. And it is so sad to see that he, he has this sort of idea that he can worship God and acknowledge him, but also worship all these other gods and acknowledge them as well, and, and maybe just give a little extra worship to the most powerful God, which he asserts is, is Daniel's God. You can't serve two masters. You can't take yourself in two directions, and that's the thing about God. God wants all of you wholly and completely devoted to him. In fact, when I talked about this at the beginning, you may recall I said they were guilty of the sin of adultery. Probably the best way that this is described is in the book of Hosea, where God actually has the prophet Hosea marry a prostitute to sort of model the way that God feels towards Israel. This is somebody that he's supposed to be committed to and that is supposed to be committed to him, and they're supposed to belong to each other in an exclusive way. And yet, the Israelites and Nebuchadnezzar here, would so often, even though they know that that's the way they actually should be, and have enough information that they ought to get that lesson through by now, that that ought to be getting through to them, they still continue to go out and worship these other gods. And unfortunately, often it led to Israel's downfall, and it leads to Nebuchadnezzar's downfall as well. Because God will not tolerate a dual loyalty. He deserves our complete loyalty, just like a spouse. 
that once we decide that we're going to follow God, that means we don't follow anything else. And that would mean other idols as well, sure. But it would also mean things like wealth or fame or other people that we find particularly interesting or attractive or whatever else it may be. Because there are so many things that we can worship in this world that is not God. Whether it's a significant other or a house or a job, there is nothing that needs to take us away from our duties and our responsibilities when it comes to our relationship with God. Because God will not tolerate spiritual adultery. He will not tolerate us splitting our loyalty between him and something else. Because doing so only hurts us. Anything else, and we might as well not have a connection to him at all. Stay the course, friends. Normally, this is the part of the video where you would expect me to ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. But the truth is, I don't really care whether you do or not. In fact, you know what? Don't subscribe. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world in the state of Alabama that you should probably be aware of. So, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.